there's two really interesting narrative violations that occurred. One is really every day that Bitcoin's existed, the 69,000 all time high, April 2021, 64,000, whatever, you know, because the narrative is all oh, Bitcoin's still down 50%, right? Super risky, volatile, yada, yada. If you dollar cost average every day, the same amount, one buck, 10 buck, doesn't matter, you'd be in the green from every mm-hmm. single day in recorded mm-hmm. history mm-hmm. at $35,000 Bitcoin. The second narrative violation is at the current trading tick, Bitcoin is down less than the long bond. Hey, so uh, the last time we talked, I think we kicked off the conversation talking about AI and how you were using it to code in Python and do all these things that you had never even had a class on, but you were doing all these miraculous things with charts and data. I'm kind of curious uh, how that's evolved since we've talked last. Yeah, crazy stuff. I mean, it's it's only the tools have only gotten exponentially better, um, and I think that's that's the trend. It's it's wild to think I I, I know we're in kind of our own little like uh, you know echo chamber of of tech and and Bitcoin and you know like you know Twitter especially a lot of this stuff is kind of like the the coolest newest thing is is flashing in front of us. Um, but I think a lot of people still have have no idea just how powerful this is. Like, obviously, it's being built and and used at like the enterprise level. Mm-hmm. But like on an you know the the average person, like I I showed my my parents who like I would understand that they're not on you know Chat GPT uh, in their day to day workflow. But I showed them some of the stuff it could do. Right, like I you know I got a um, one of my parents had a medical procedure and they got a, a, a doctor's list, just super crappy handwriting of just whatever the notes were. Um, I took that, I put it in and it not only like read it, but then I asked it questions about probabilities and asked it about symptoms and, you know, was it perfect? Like who knows? Right. But they were amazed that it wasn't a doctor on the, they were like, who's, who's saying that? And I was like, well, no, it's, it's the AI that's, that's, that's feeding you these probabilities and info. And so, you know, never mind like the whole, you know, market stuff or, or like the, you know, day to day coding. Um, but just like, the scope and scale of what you can do is is pretty mind blowing, um, and yeah, it's going to dematerialize a whole lot of stuff. Um, it's also going to get kind of like scary with the deep fakes and you know the mm-hmm. fake images and you know a whole another rabbit hole itself is like how that's going to be leveraged with propaganda and like the psyops and so work. You know, we got a weird decade ahead of us. Exciting, super exciting, um, but very weird. You know, what's so crazy to me. So I've been listening to quite a bit of uh, Peter Diamandis. He's been interviewing a a bunch of AI folks. And uh, there was a there was a gentleman, I think his name is Imad. He was on he's like a leading expert in in AI. And he was just talking about how much like space these models are taking. So like GPT-4 and I might be wrong, but I'm I'm pretty sure this this number is correct. Quoting his interview, he said that it was compressed down to 200 gig. Like you can ask this thing anything. It's not like it's not like referencing some depository where it's pulling the data from, right? Like it has after they trained it, it has been compressed to just 200 gig. Like I could store that here on, on my computer here at my house. And then I can ask it any question. Like I can provide any type of input to this compressed 200 gigs. And then it spews out the response to anything. And with like high precision accuracy, that's like, I just can't even wrap my head around how profound that is. Like, it doesn't even make sense, like how something like that could even be possible. And, um, you know, they're talking about like GPT-5 and what they're going to be feeding it and how like the the processing and everything that they're going to be doing to create these models. But the compression of the actual file after it comes out probably won't be all that much larger. I mean, it'll be larger than 200 gig, but probably not a lot larger. Like, I don't know, but I would guess 300, 400 gig on GPT-5 and the the level of performance is going to be, it's not going to be twice as good. It's going to be like a thousand times better than four. So like, yeah, I just, I, I, I'm, I don't even know how to like comprehend like what's taking place right now. It's totally nuts. Totally nuts. Um, I mean, you got to give him a lot of credit. Jeff Booth was coming on here and he was talking about, he was getting, you know, doing the folding paper analogy and you fold it 30 times or something and it goes to the moon or the sun or what. There was some like exponential um, 
analogy he would always give. And, you know, like the AI stuff and like all of like Morris Law, it, it sounds good. And you're like, well, that's really incredible. And then to watch it happen in a year, two years, like every month, it's like leaps and bounds better. You know, you can submit a picture of a meme and it breaks down to me <laughs> like no text, just an image, right? It's just like, wait, this thing is, I mean, it's not thinking for itself, but it's, it, I mean, to us, it appears like it's thinking for itself, yeah. right? So it's pretty mind blowing. Um, you know, I, I mean, we're just along for the ride at this point. There's no, the genie's not, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle, right? Like we're not, mm -hmm. we're not putting this thing away. So for better or worse, we have it here. Um, <laughs> get ready, get ready. Have you been still using it to, to make charts and to kind of just help yourself analyze, uh, yeah large amounts of data? Yeah. So um, my day-to-day, -day, I'm doing some stuff with UTXO management, um, kind of a Bitcoin-based fund. And so, uh, again, like didn't really know how to code at the, the turn of the year. Um, and with um, one of my buddies, Sam Rule, we've, we've been putting together uh, dashboards pulling from like, you know, five, six, seven APIs, um, kind of making just like interactive charts and data streams and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and Sam's a, Sam's a better coder than, than myself, but we're both leaning on it pretty heavily you know, mm -hmm. feeding it documentation and all this other stuff like errors and, and, you know, we, it's, it's not the best thing in the world. I'm sure there's, there's uh, far better coders, but, um, you know, for someone that's like, again, never had any formal training, um, and it's just kind of like making it up as I go. It's, it's a pretty powerful tool. It's unreal. It's unreal. Hey, uh, where I want to really kind of start off the conversation is in the bond market. Um, we had the, on the previous episode to this, we had a mastermind discussion and had some intense debate over whether treasuries, the whole the whole bond yield curve, whether it's going to keep selling off, whether it's going to start getting bid. Um, to make this even more fascinating, we have the largest amount of calls on TLT, which is the long duration bond ETF that's out there. 350,000 contract call contracts per day right now, which is an all-time high. And we have... Uh, all-time shorts happening on the futures to basically counterbalance this long, uh, all the market makers in order to basically cover their bases are going uh, short on the futures market in order to cover their, their tracks. So we have this massive setup, right? That whatever the underlying ends up doing, it's going to probably be extremely dramatic because you have so much leverage being poured into this. What are your thoughts? Like, where is this going? Yeah. Um, I mean, for the past two, three years, um, you know, I, I would say I was, I was in the camp of, you know, yourself, Lynn Alden, Luke Groman, a couple other like very, very verbal bond bears out there I, there's there's many more i i didn't just name but you know kind of like a hard money thesis bonds fixed income paper uh debt assets are are screwed and that was you know slam dunk home run correct um and i think we've seen in terms of the principal value of of long bonds globally you've seen the first you know the past two years the price action the worst the worst bond price action in in recorded history modern and you know there's some like there's like a bank of america chart it's like the worst treasury drawdown since 1770 and you're like okay so ever <laughs> like you know um and so i think in terms of that we've we've seen the big move and yeah. you know there's a lot of debate about you know the long end going to to five and a half or six or seven or no it's you know we're entering the deflationary phase finally of this titan cycle and they're going to get really really big um but i, I think you know the the interesting thing for me is like you know are, are is TLT or is the long bond like a good trade over the next six months or twelve months like that's a that's a topic that you can have a really really long debate on, um, but I think regardless of that like bonds are at at best in my opinion at best you buy them for a trade and I'm not telling you to buy bonds or or not right um, that's everyone else's decision, um, but it's a trade at best in my opinion. Right. Of like the long end, you know, because um, like I will never uh, even at five percent. Right. I have zero interest in lending my money to the U.S. government or any government in fiat denominated terms for 30 years. Um, so if you think about, you know, how the how a recession comes, 
um, after yield curve inversion, right? Like a lot of the pain in the stock market and in financial assets and a recession doesn't come when the yield curve inverts. It comes after the yield curve uninverts after an inversion, right? And historically, that that inversion comes, you know, the last, I don't know, three, four or five cases have been because the front end falls, right? The, the Fed cuts, you know, if you're looking at, say, the two year, which is kind of just a blended average of the next two years of the market's expectations for rates. Well, it beca- it's, it's because the Fed sees weakness, you start to see real pain, they cut. Well, this cycle, it's been really interesting because, you know, the Fed's been holding, they're holding the, the economy, surprisingly, um, to a lot of us, including myself has been very robust in fiat nominal terms, right? Mm. They're running massive deficits, very robust. Consumer is stronger than you'd expect. Um, we haven't seen that kind of like recession um, in the labor market. It's starting to crack a bit um, or the spending. Um, so front end rates have been high and, and we've actually seen a bear steepener, which is the long end blowing out and rising up to near around the level of the, of the front end. Um, so there's, there's some really, really smart people out there that I respect and follow that are very, very bullish on bonds here. And there's people that I also respect and I think are very, very smart that are like, no way they're running 8% annualized deficits before the recession hits. Um, Mm. and so, you know, I, I, I don't really have a strong, um, bias in one way or another. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't think my edge is, you know, going, (laughs) speculating on where our on where long end rates go over the next three months or six months. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that the economy is is going from, you know, is is in the deceleration phase for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, rates are still five and a half percent where we just, you know, post probably the second half of 2023 after inflation tailed off a bit um, in year over year terms, right? The, the derivative of inflation, you know, prices are still higher than ever, but they're, they're rising uh, not as fast as they once were. We're now actually just kind of in the the tighten the tightening phase, right? Because all of 2022, even when rates were being writ, uh, were were rising, inflation was still eight percent, nine percent, seven percent, and so that's monetary policy isn't tight with inflation at seven and rates at five, right? Yeah. But yeah, in a in a very indebted economy, monetary policy is a bit tighter when when rates are five and a half percent for six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve months. Um, and inflation's lower than that. So I think that's where we are. And so, you know, do long bonds probably give a, a pretty good trade risk reward? You know, especially if you, you know, the bond math, like the convexity of the bond and how it trades, right? I think like a 1% move lower in yields versus 1% move higher in yields is like a very, very asymmetric bet right now. I don't know the math off the top of my head, but, you know, some bond guys could tell you. Um, so like, there's a lot of reasons why it's a good trade, right? Or or not, depending on on what you think. Um, but I, I think the, the story is still the same, right? The debt to GDP is 120%. There's no way you get out of this historically, you know, look at every single financial analog in history without a sustained period of inflation higher than interest rates, right? So are you, do you want to buy and hold long duration paper in that environment? No, you don't. Um, and I think that's unchanged. You know what I think is a really important point that you're making here right now? What you're really talking about is speculation versus investing, right? Uh, when we look at the size of the of the of the money that's going into this market right now, we're talking trillions of dollars. I don't think you can classify it as investing. I think you got to classify this as speculation, and we're talking about speculation to the tune of trillions, because. To, to the point that you made, it, nobody's buying this to hold it for 30 years. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Because everybody can look at the math on the horizon and say, oh, yeah, like if you're holding that to maturity, you're going to get wrecked. I think everybody that's buying it long knows that. And so because that if if you buy into that logic and you agree with what I just said, that means they're speculators. That means they're they, they're rolling the dice. They're, yep. they're, they're betting on what they think the market psychology is going to be much more so than buying something that they actually think is valuable. Yep. And I think that that's just really concerning as a society at large, uh, global society at large, is that this is what fiat has pushed us to, which is everybody becomes a speculator. Nobody's actually buying something because they actually think it's valuable and that it's going to 
you know, provide value to society. It's it's garbage. It's total yeah. garbage. And you are you are being forced to step into the casino with trillions in buying power. And it's just very frustrating to to kind of see that that's what this. And you know what? So much of it gets lost because everybody's just like, oh, well, you know, maybe I can make my mark because I'm going to be the guy who correctly called the the bottom of this bond bear market. And then I made a bunch of money on the upside for, you know, the next year, the next six months until they step in and and obliterate it from there. Um, what? Is, so right now it's super precarious because you have so much leverage that's pouring into this exact moment in time. And I think everybody's looking at the last 40 years and they're saying, well, if you get that right, like you make a whole bunch of money as the bid comes back into the market because the 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 government comes to rescue it all. I just don't know that that's necessarily the case this time. Like the government stepping in to rescue it this time. Like I don't know about you, but I think the top of this 40 year uh bull market in bonds was COVID. Like I think yeah, that was absolutely that, Yeah. That was the top. That was it. So like moving forward, what what does that look like when the government steps in to quote unquote rescue it? Because rescuing it means the numbers are getting worse, right? It, because, and, and I think people that are looking back at like the 1940s to 1980, when, when we were in a 40 year bear market in bonds, literally 40 years of bear market, the difference between that period of time and now is we didn't have 120 percent debt to gdp right we or eight percent uh deficit to gdp which is better demographics too and the <laughs> demographics and and the the total obliteration of mid-cap small cap businesses that have been all consolidated into the hands of a couple and you don't have a naturally occurring you have a totally synthetic economy at this point. You didn't have that from 40 to 1980. So people that are thinking that treasuries get bid through that, I'm not saying that they won't. What I'm saying is it, it's not such a guarantee uh, like we have seen for 80 years that that's what plays out. Right? I'm curious, do you agree? Do you think that you could actually see them sell off harder by some announcement that they're stepping in. Is that yeah. possible? I saw, I think maybe you shared it. It was, it was Luke, Luke Roman saying like, Hey, the, you know, and there's been a bunch of people for the past, you know, 10, 20 years that said, Hey, the feds trapped, the feds trapped, the feds trapped, which, you know, may or may not have, have been true at the point, but the, the trend has gotten worse. You know, the, the, the outlook has gotten worse repeatedly time and time again with each subsequent intervention. And now it's it's it may may or may not be true, right? Where uh, you correctly called BTFP basically a, a you know yield implicit yield curve control for the banks, you're bailing out the banks and their bond exposure while leaving Main Street hanging. Uh, but now with with a long bond trading where it is, it's like if yields blow out and you intervene and say, hey, we're we're printing, maybe there's a you know a knee jerk reaction and and stuff, and the, the you know fixed income gets bid, yields fall, but then it's like, wait, oh, they're <laughs> They're printing. Like, why would I hold this paper? Um, so the environment's very, very different than it's been. Um, there's no question in my mind the nominal top and the real top in fixed income was COVID, right? You're never going to see. Yeah. I, I, I mean, even if, even if, and I, I am extremely skeptical and doubtful this happens. But even say we we see the 30 year trade back to one percent, which is, in my opinion, is absolutely not <laughs> happening. I agree. Um, I agree. But even in that scenario, you've had 30% inflation since that point. Mm -hmm. Right. So so for for you to get back to your all-time high purchasing power terms in fixed income, you need to see yields go negative, which like again, this is a bizarre world that doesn't exist in a free market, right? Like the, the whole reason that anybody besides someone that was mandated to buy fixed income or bonds at one percent, the reason that they would possibly be bullish. The reason people were buying a hundred year Austria debt, right? Or, you know, negative debt for, you know, German bonds was, oh, well, if it goes more negative, I make a boatload of money. Mm -hmm. And so like that whole environment is, is done, right? The 60, 40 inverse correlation of bonds and stocks. 
that everyone's made a bunch of money off of, you know, 2022 was a shock for them because bonds got killed, stocks got killed. Um, now in 2023, bonds are flat. You know, they they rebounded and then since it sold off and stocks have killed it. Big tech has killed it. You know, Fang plus NVIDIA and Tesla have killed it. Mm. Um, and that's just started to, to normalize. But now it's really interesting because, and I don't think this is so much of like a directional indicator um, of like, you know, it's buy stocks or buy bonds or, or, or you know, short, short one or the other right away. But if you're looking at like at, like the equity risk premium, ERP, difference in, in expected earnings, expected yield of investing in stocks and bonds, it's the lowest it's ever been in recorded history, right? Mm-hmm. So, so is that saying that that the bonds, you know, go up and decrease in yield, or does that mean that stocks are grossly mispriced, right? Like the the basket of of tech, really. I mean, it's just that the top seven equities, the top seven stocks, everything else, the Russell, everything's been getting been getting killed. I think there's like thirty percent of of companies in the Russell don't make any money. They're like mm-hmm. cash flow negative. Mm-hmm. Right. So like all of this stuff is completely different than it's been in the past. And we don't have a balanced, you know, a, a balanced uh, economy here. Like you said, we have this distorted kind of passive zombified, you know, equity index environment um, where, again, no one's really conducting like investment calculation. They're just, no. oh, you know, let, like, let me just buy QQQ because QQQ has positive momentum. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's a real, real potential, in my opinion, for for pain. Um, you know, whether what what that looks like if the treasury continues to run two trillion dollar deficits, that's really interesting because I don't think anybody and no portfolio manager, no no one that's invested in the United States in in anyone's lifetime has experienced that. But you know, maybe maybe who has? Well, anybody that's kind of invested or ran money in in an emerging market, right? where they understand this environment. They understand what happens in an environment where you have just no, just absolutely no fiscal prudence and you're just you're just printing at will, you're issuing money anywhere and everywhere, you know, 100 100 billion dollars to Ukraine and Israel or you know what like whatever. I'm not even getting into the political left right. I don't care about that. It's more just like, oh, you know, debt ceiling doesn't matter actually. We're going to issue 2 trillion dollars and just let it rip. Yeah. Um and, you know, I think that should be pause and a cause for concern for anybody that's, that's, you know, managing money, right? It's like, you know, what's your benchmark? Um, and that's in flux, right? Because even the official like inflation numbers, right, may or may not actually be an accurate indicator of that, right? I think there's a real good, good case for even equities, right? In say like 2021 inflation adjusted terms being maybe not like a generational top, but being a top for a while, right? If you didn't, whether you want to use CPI or some shadow stats or M2 or whatever you want to use, right? If you just look at where the S&P 500 traded, like as a basket and you put it and you say, just divide it by CPI to keep it simple, right? We may just be in for a decade of chop, right? Where like stocks do a decent job of maintaining or kind of quasi maintaining your purchasing power, but it's not the free lunch up eight to 10% year over year compounded returns that people were used to for the past decade, two decades, four decades in the case of like, you know, the baby boomers. Um, so that's a real interesting thought too. And I don't think many people have, have, you know, kind of ran through those ideas. I, the, the thing that I think people are, uh, missing with this basis trade that is just insanely levered right now is if the spot does take the prices lower, the bond prices lower and the yields higher, you're going to have a squeeze of epic proportions that quickly make these numbers that don't look like they work today from like a fiscal standpoint and just totally amplifies the living hell out of them. And um, that's when things potentially could get really, really crazy. And I'm not saying that that's my base I, I don't even know what my base case is. I'm just looking at the amount of leverage that's sitting here right now at this moment in time, because I can see the the rationale for a recession coming, right? Like we can see the spreads between the 10 and two. And like, if you just look at all the various spreads, it's kind of suggesting that uh, unemployment's going to really start to to take off here in the coming six months. 
Um, like all of those uh, metrics, like leading indicator metrics are saying the recession is coming and it's coming very soon in the, in the coming year for sure. Um, so like I can understand why people might think that that's what's about to play out here. But if it doesn't, because there's so much leverage at this exact moment, like it could get really hairy really fast. And uh, boy, I, I just can't even imagine what that would result in. But no question, no question there. I guess I'm just highlighting. I think this is really, really important for people to pay attention to this bond yield curve right now. And, um, you know, if they can't keep the oil prices in check and some other things that are leading and, uh, you know, in indicators of inflation, I think that's going to be the thing that potentially tips it or uh, maybe causes people to really have to unwind this this really hard position that they're taking right now that we're going to get a, a bid uh, into yep. the next 12 months. Uh, I, I 100% agree. Um, I think I think I maybe said it on, on, on your show at the end of last year, at the end of 2022. And I mean, here we are with with yields having, you know, broken the the 2022 highs they made, it was a, it was a really interesting stat, you know, just a small sample size, two of two, but it's something I think everyone should ponder. Um, and it was the last time this was in 2022, but it was the last time stocks and bonds drew down, um, to the magnitude that they did in 2022 of like 20% plus each, um, was two separate occasions and it was 1931 and it was 1969. Um, and in each of those instances, two years following, the U.S. defaulted on its debt. Um, mm -hmm. They broke they broke the gold peg in both cases. Um, mm -hmm. So you know maybe that's not a technical default. However, you want to <laughs> think about it, you know. But FDR seized your gold, and Nixon said we're not we're not honoring the gold the international gold peg. So I mean, here we are with fiat currencies, right? We have no gold peg. So what is and with you know with 120 percent debt to GDP, whatever it is, maybe it's, I think it's a bit higher at the at the current mm -hmm. moment. You know, there's been 53 instances of of governments reaching that level ever, and all of them except modern day Japan and the U.S. currently have defaulted, either implicitly or explicitly. Explicitly means you know they literally didn't pay it back. In the case that you know the 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 debt was in say dollars or another currency or gold, or implicitly because basically they inflated it away, hyperinflated or just you know a sustained period of financial repression, and even like modern day Japan, right? You see what's happening with the yen. Right, everyone goes. Well, Japan's got away with it for so long, and I say, okay, I'll yeah, look at the yen. <laughs> like, like, yeah. So, right, if you think about what's Japan doing and to address their debt, well, they're doing yield curve control, you know, and they've they've gone from a twenty five basis point peg in the ten year to a fifty basis point peg, and now they've said, well, we're targeting one percent. Right, and so Japan, every time the yields and they've moved it, right, but every time that the ten year goes above that that peg and you see, you know, the swaps market and a bunch of speculators shorting that debt, challenging, you know, shorting the bonds, shorting the currency, um, basically speculating attack, um, this, the central bank, they just print more money. Right. And then they, on the other side, they sell their yen or they sell their, they sell their dollars to buy the yen. They sell their treasuries and buy yen. And so they're trying to maintain the, the play this impossible game. And they do have a lot of foreign exchange reserves, but I ask people say like, okay, well, if your analog is modern day Japan, like if that's your like, oh, the U.S. can get away with this, right? For so long, like they can they can do what Japan has has done. Don't worry about it. Well, in that scenario, what's your dollar versus the yen? If if the U.S. is conducting yield curve control, whether implicitly or explicitly, or the capping yield somehow, they come out with some word salad facility with the Fed and the Treasury, like what? What's your dollar to the yen in that scenario? Like if the if the US comes down and says, yeah, we're we're capping the, the 30 year at five percent, or what like again, whatever it looks like, who knows? The BTFP on steroids, right? With more complexity to kind of fool the the modern day person on, as to what's actually unfolding. Um, what do you do? Like what as an investment manager? And for me, like I think you see Bitcoin react as the dollar is doing against the yen on steroids. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's what I mean. And gold, too. Right. Um, but again, like that, if there's we're in like really unprecedented territory and there's really there's no actual aside from, you know, an unprecedented productivity boom, which maybe your thesis like is, is AI does that. Right. We see just a massive real productivity boom. Sure. Uh, I respect your opinion if you think that. Um, but aside from that, there's there's actually no way out other than 
a sustained period of inflation and and basically the central bank punishing creditors and savers. And so that's that's where we are. And that, you know, that's completely unchanged. Two points to what you were just saying. The the uh the productivity boom because of AI uh is so laughable to me that when when I hear people say that, it's like, okay, so in in the past when productivity happened, it was because there was humans that were that were in the loop. What we're talking about now moving forward is humans not being in the loop and it's being consolidated into more and more robots and, and software. But um, the uh, the other point that you had brought up as, as far as the implicit default uh, in the 30s and in uh, 69, um, I think for people that that hear that and they're like, OK, so we came off the gold standard, we came off the gold standard. So what would that be now? Well, we're working off of a quote unquote petrodollar system. So what it would look like now is it is a total erosion of that relationship. And uh, so just for for people to think about, right? Yeah. What what would that look like? Well, uh, I think we're seeing that right in, in real time. And we have since uh, since COVID happened where. Um, a lot of these net producing oil uh, nations are, they're not having it anymore. They're not going to save their retained uh, earnings for the physical material that they're delivering. Uh, they're not going to save that in treasuries when the treasuries are mathematically bound to just keep going, uh, to, to keep getting debased, aggressively debased, just based on the mathematics, right? So, yeah. Well, I mean, it would probably look like, you know, the U.S. draining its SPR um, at the fastest Bingo. rate in history. Bingo. And, you know, all, uh, the biggest oil producing nations like Russia and Saudi Arabia and Iran and yada, 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 all, you know, attempting to to reduce their exposure of treasuries because of, of conflicts uh, abroad. And, you know, so, you know, if we ever saw that happening, it would, it would be really um, curious. <laughs> Time to yeah. wake up, folks. Time to wake up. Wonder what wonder what we're gonna use as something that we can all agree upon that doesn't <laughs> require trust, that is bound by energy. It's like, oh my lord. Okay. We were talking about uh gamma squeezes there. T talk to me about the Bitcoin price action this past week. Cause we, you know, one morning I got up, it was like at 29,000 in USD terms. And then, then at some point in that same day, it was at 35,000 for a $6,000 move. What is causing this, Dylan? Or what caused that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, options market is quite, quite the fun one to, to dive into because there's all these Greeks and terms, you know, gamma and delta and theta and vega. And it, it's a bit esoteric, but uh, essentially... What happened for most of 2023, especially following the, and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but I think it, it, it holds true, is after we saw all of these counterparties blow up in 2022, specifically like the, the genesis of the world, who were, who were you know, borrowing and lending uh, in, in Bitcoin terms and dollar terms and a, a bunch of different cryptos, we saw, you know, and they all blew up, right? Um, and in t since you know 2023 started, Bitcoin's gone from like 18,000 to 30, and for about six months was ranging around. And you saw record levels, low levels of realized volatility in Bitcoin and implied volatility in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those that are familiar with the difference, realized volatility is just how much the actual price action is is moving around, and you can just look at price for that. Implied volatility for the S and P 500 that'd be the VIX, or for bonds that'd be Move, the Move Index. Um, and for Bitcoin, you can look at something like there's a bunch of them. Bviv is one of them. Uh, this company named Balmex is, is doing this. They're using Deribit options. There's also like Dbol and a couple other ones. But essentially, that implied volatility and uh, you know these indexes are only a couple of years old, so we don't have too much to work with um, as the options market's grown bigger. But implied volatility was near record lows, um, near all time lows as Bitcoin is just ranging around from 30, 30,000, 25,000. And so what you saw was because the genesis of the world blew up and there wasn't really any, and again, there's no way to natively get yield on your Bitcoin. It always, it always is, um, you know, that you are taking some, some risk. It's, well, you know, whether it's hidden or not. Um, but, you know, those lending vehicles all blew up. So you saw a bunch of counterparties. Um, I think 
you know, room, the rumors kind of where some of them were in China. Uh, we don't really know. It's a bit opaque, but to, 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 to get that Bitcoin native yield, and I, it's honestly technically incorrect to call it yield, but for the sake of the conversation, we'll call it quote unquote yield. They were selling call options. So Bitcoin's at 28K. I'm going to sell next month. I'm going to sell a $32,000 call option. And so as long as, as long as the price of Bitcoin doesn't go above 32,000, or you know the volatility stays low, it goes down. I collect a bit of a a fee, a, a premium, and so I, I I get that in Bitcoin terms. And so you saw basically this this trade just get rolled over, over and over again throughout 2023 of selling calls, selling calls. Whenever Bitcoin pumped a bit, sell a call, and it and it almost in a synthetic sort of way. And obviously hindsight is 2020, but you see this happen oftentimes with you know. Uh, indices or like a like a Tesla, right? Or even like the meme stocks of the world. A lot of the you know massively uh, dramatic volatile moves, upside or downside, are amplified by by these dynamics in the options market mm-hmm. gamma squeeze. And so they were selling these options, and basically, you know, different than maybe a traditional just short short exposure. I'm shorting an asset where it's one to one as price climbs. The, the pain of this short call trade was amplified with each additional uptick in the mm-hmm. Bitcoin market. So they were short, but the short exposure, both because of the price action and the volatility, as volatility spiked and as price spiked, it, like, it compounded their pain. Um, so that's why you know price went from 30,000 to 35,000 in about three seconds or like five minutes was just because there was this massive short trade out there. Um, and so they blew up, right? So it's like picking pennies in front of a steamroller for all of 2023. And, you know, someone out there evidently blew up. Um, and Galaxy actually this morning, um, and who knows uh, when this episode's released next week, if if we see them get squeezed again, but it looks like they may have rolled over some of that short exposure and they, they're they now short up into the, you know, high 30s, 30, 36, 37, 38 um, short gamma once again. So Gamma's, gamma squeezes can work both ways. I can also, you know, sell puts, right? I can sell puts as income and I'm short that option. Um, and I can get my face ripped off in the other way. But it's pretty interesting. It's a very nascent market. It's very liquid. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the spot market volumes are the lowest they've been in a while. And honestly, I think this plays really into like the, the hodl mindset of just no one selling the coins, right? Like mm-hmm. across literally every duration, one month, three months, six months, there's a really cool tool called HODL Waves, Unchained Capital, um, showed it. And it's basically showing how much Bitcoin hasn't moved since X period, you know. And basically across every single duration you look at, one month, three months, six months, one year, two years, it's an all-time high amount of Bitcoin that hasn't been moved mm-hmm. um, as a percent of the total supply. So the market's just like super, super tight. No one's selling, especially after the last two and a half years of of madness. So, you know... If there's any inflows, you know, there's spot ETF rumors, all of that, you know, there's not a whole lot of Bitcoin to go around, um, mm-hmm. you know, especially if there's horse buyers. So that's where we get some really aggressive moves and you see, you know, weeks where the NASDAQ and S&P and bonds are down 5% and Bitcoin's up 25, right? Like that's, that breaks a lot of models. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing. Down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. It's probably one of the only markets where uh, people who have significant positions, um, they're looking at the price action over the past year. It's up, call it 100% uh, this year. And I would I would argue that a lot of people that have significant position sizes are just yawning. They're just like, oh yeah, this is this is absolutely nothing. Like this does not even uh begin to entice me <laughs> to some if anything they their conviction quadrupled. Um and I don't think that that's normal. That's that's not what you would see in any other financial instrument that 
moves a hundred percent in a year. Like people would be, you know, taking, taking some of the win and doing other things and looking for the next trade or whatever. And you don't, you do not have that for people that have significant position sizes, or at least the people I talk to that have what I, what I would assume are significant position sizes. Nope, not at all. There's, there's two really interesting narrative violations that occurred, um, on the back of that, that move last week. One is across every single, and I'm not sure, maybe it's changed. I mean, the price is near the highs now, so I doubt it. But across every single, really every day um, that Bitcoin's existed, the 69,000 all-time high, April 2021, 64,000, whatever, you know, because the narrative is, all oh, Bitcoin's still down 50%, right? Super risky, volatile, yada, yada. If you dollar cost average every day, the same amount, one buck, 10 buck, doesn't matter, um, you'd be in the green from every mm. single day in recorded mm. history mm-hmm. at $35,000 Bitcoin. The second narrative violation is at the current current trading tick, Bitcoin is down less than the long bond. So you have an entire you know financial complex that's t- telling you this thing's too risky, it's too volatile, you know, it's it's untouchable, it's not an investable asset, you know, stick with what you know, 60-40, Right. And the 6040 is down 35%. Right. So, like Bitcoin, it's like, okay, it's too risky. I, sure. Right. Um, but it's down 50% from the highs. And anybody that's just been buying the thing and just sitting there is up ever. Right. So, it doesn't matter when you started. You could have literally FOMO'd in at 60,000 and just bought a little bit, stayed the course, and you're in the green today. So, like, again, it's, it's obviously it's just volatile. Dylan, there's a ton of people that that's how they do it. They just dollar yeah. cost average on the week or by the day or by the month. And that's just it. So, yep. And, and if you don't believe the math, go do it. And you're going to yep. be shocked at what you find. Yep. You're going to be so shocked. It's, it's volatile, right? It's always been volatile. Um, but like that, and it sounds like a meme when Bitcoin's, you know, 70% from its highs. But the volatility is quite literally your friend. And you can do the math. You can, like, again, I'm not telling uh, my baby boomer parents that aren't in finance what a sharp ratio is because they don't care. Right. But, but if you're in finance, like run the math, do the, you know, look at the sharp ratios, you know, run the, the passive because like all these 60 40 portfolios are passively indexing as well. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing that math, uh, well, do it, do it on a Bitcoin spot index. Right. Um, yeah. And so where, yeah, it's, it's far too volatile. Great. Um, but the long bonds down 55% on no volatility, right? So, mm-hmm. so what does that tell you about, about, you know, all the preconceived notions uh, of the, you know, the finance industry and Bitcoin. And so I think that's a lot of conversations happened last week in financial advisor circles, you know, that spot ETF hasn't rolled out. I, you know, who knows? I think it's probably Q1 of next year at some point. Maybe there's, you know, a couple of things on the regulatory front that happened before that. Um, you, you posted a good article last week, um, on kind of the, the narrative of like, you know, the terrorist financing and, and all of that, who knows like how much of a, of a deal they try to make with, with Tether and Binance, um, we have yet to see, and they've, they've mentioned some of that stuff in previous ETF filings or, or denials, but I think it's quite clear. The only reason like people, people, um, the narrative I saw was pretty funny. They were like, well, yeah, Bitcoiners are capitulating to Wall Street. You know, no. they're celebrating the spot ETF, and I'm like, no, capitulation is happening the other way. Like the the Bitcoiners don't care. Like yeah. the 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 narrative, it's it's completely reverse of what you think, and that the capitulation is happening because people are going up to Larry, Larry Fink, and BlackRock and investment banks, and they're saying, hey, like I want this exposure, and I I want it in my Charles Schwab account. I don't want it. You know, on I don't want it on like Coinbase or I don't want it in your private fund that's a liquid or whatever. Like I want it just like how I have my other ETFs. And so like that the capitulation is happening from Wall Street capitulating in, right? And they're the ones that are knocking on Gary's door, Gary Gensler, and saying, We want this thing. Um, mm-hmm. it's not the other way around. One of the on the idea of the sharp ratio and talking to your parents, here's a metric that I just find mind blowing. Uh pick any date in Bitcoin's history. And then go back four years to measure the performance of that four-year period. You can you can take the top, you can take the low, whatever, wherever you want to cherry pick the the number. But then go back four years, look at that performance, and then assume you held 
2% of your portfolio in Bitcoin and 98% in cash. And that portfolio construction of only 2% Bitcoin and 98% cash will match the S&P 500, the S&P 500 performance over that same period that you select. But you'll do it with one fourth the volatility. Okay, that for people that uh, are trying to understand what the sharp ratio is, it's 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 showing you performance. So you're matching performance with only a two percent versus a hundred percent in the S and P five hundred, and you're getting one fourth of the volatility in your portfolio. Um, and <laughs> yep, yeah, you you select the four year period, and that, and the reason why you do four years because Bitcoin has a four year having cycle, and I think that that's uh, probably a, a great way to kind of understand the. Uh, the cycle theory, like if you're talking about like a traditional cycle, or at least the way it used to work uh, in equities, it was ev every eight years or whatever. I think that that's getting smashed like a hammer. But, um, but anyway, so that's just a, a, a another neat metric. You were talking about dollar cost averaging. I think that's another one for people to to dig up and look at. Willy Wu on this idea of you know, derivatives and spot price. He was really kind of hammering home this idea that he thinks the price of Bitcoin can be controlled by derivatives. What would what is your response? And I, I saw you guys going back and forth and I was also involved there a little bit. And and Dylan, just for, you know, being open with the audience, you and I agree on this uh, versus Willie. But like, what's your point of view as you would respond to Willie, who's saying that he thinks derivatives can kind of wag the tail of the spot price? Yeah, um, you know, there's there's I think a few different camps or like maybe subsectors of like the, you know, the futures argument. Um one is it kind of the gold bugs who are saying, well, look at we we have this this hard money asset and for 20 years, 30 years, like forever, as we've been investing in it, it's been manipulated. Like and they point to the JP Morgan, you know, guys getting fined and fired and all of that and the settlements there. And it's like, see, we we told you um they're manipulating the futures market and and putting a lid on the price. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, yeah, because there is no spot gold market. Like, mm -hmm. oh, well, why, why is that? Um, because you can't physically settle gold instantaneously. I can't buy gold on an exchange and withdraw it in 30 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. And I do that with Bitcoin, you know, a few times a week. And mm -hmm. so there's the, there's that component, the futures market, you know, whether it's like for, for gold, it's the calendar's future, mm -hmm. right? Next month, uh, next week, whatever. Um, where for Bitcoin, there's spot market and there's also a futures market. There's calendar futures, but more particularly, there's the perpetual future, mm -hmm. which never expires and just rolls over. And so to to you know break it down, if you had said, well, the futures market is, you know, either artificially inflating the price or suppressing the price, there's a few things to consider. One, for every long, there's a short, right? Two, there's a dynamic financing rate or funding rate, as it's technically called, in this market that references the spot market price. So say spot Bitcoin's trading at thirty five thousand. If the futures market's trading at thirty four thousand, there's an there's an interest rate that the people on the long side of the trade are getting paid to buy it. So if you buy this contract and hold it, you're receiving every eight hours an interest rate. And that interest rate is calculated based on where the price is relative to the spot market or the spot reference rate. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, you're getting, if, if the price is you know too high compared to spot market or too low, you're get, the, the longs are directly paying the shorts or the shorts are directly paying the longs. So any derivative dislocation you see in bull markets, it often happens to the upside. There's a ton of speculators. Everybody's going long. They're you know using Bitcoin as collateral, dollars as collateral. There's a frenzy. It's a mania, and that often resolves in you know dramatic deleveraging events. Mm -hmm. um, versus you know say like December of 2022, it was the opposite, and the spot market price and the price on CME futures was actually under. Uh, the, the the futures market was under the price of the spot market, so so you were actually paying to go short Bitcoin. You, well, the shorts were paying the longs, um, and all of those all of those people got blown out of the water, right? So uh, the notion that Willie says that you can you know suppress this price on a long time frame is, in my opinion, wrong. The one thing that to consider is this goes out the window if there's a, a, a an exchange that's not operating fairly, right? And in that case. 
the solvency of the exchange or the the legitimacy of that exchange is in question. It's not it's not a matter of, you know, if the futures market itself is suppressing the price. So like with SBF, right? They were like, well, you know, look at look at what happened with Sam. It's like, well, yeah, he was leveraging his solvency to cap this thing, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the futures market itself that was acting as the mechanism because that's very much self-correcting. Um, so I don't know if that made sense or not, but that's my my two cents. Because at a certain point, there are exchanges that are allowing people to withdraw Bitcoin because they're operating ethically. And yeah. it be, it just becomes so obvious because we can audit on-chain data that uh, if there was a really bad actor, let's say backed up by a sovereign entity that was allowing them to manipulate it through derivatives, that it would eventually manifest itself because there'd be so much coin consolidation of people that are acting in the rest of the global uh, economy network uh, that it would become obvious that, oh my God, there's 95% of the coins haven't moved in the last you know year. Like how in the world is this price doing this kind of situation? And I think it would point to the exchange that would have been manipulated. And then it really gets uh, the cascading <laughs> event that would that would materialize out of that would be quite phenomenal to watch. And I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that's what I think is happening. I'm just saying I think that that's on a long tail. If if that was the scenario playing out, I think it would still manifest itself as a free and open market that would that would demonstrate the truth. I think there's there's also another important point, and and it like a lot of people I think, you know, if you're not following these markets closely, don't don't realize this. Like there isn't a Bitcoin price. There's there's a hundred Bitcoin prices on a hundred different exchanges, and obviously some are bigger than the others. But if say let's say on you know FTX 2.0, right? <laughs> there there's someone out there that's you know maybe backed up by government or you know just a whale or someone in you know, big bank that wants to suppress this thing and not let it rip. Well, you're going to see that, right? You're going to see that on FTX 2.0, the price of Bitcoin is 34,000, while on Binance and uh, BitMEX and Coinbase and, you know, XYZ exchange, the price of Bitcoin is 35,000, 35,500. Like you're going to see the discrepancy, whether that's the futures market or the spot market. And, and there's going to be a, a flow of coins, you know, whether it's you know, withdrawing from one exchange to the other, right? You're going to see that be arbed away. And so mm -hmm. at a certain point, the person that's trying to suppress this thing, right? Like you can get away with a, a good trade, right? But if I'm sitting here and, and the price just keeps, just keeps, you know, bidding up and every single time I'm short, I'm selling, I'm selling, I'm selling. Well, it's like, I mean, you're, you're trying to suppress a beach ball underwater uh, at some point. And you're going to get blown out of the water. Like no one has infinite Bitcoin denominated capital, right? So that you're going to get checked. You're going to get called on your short position. Or if, again, if the exchange is, is operating in such a manner, the exchange solvency is going to get called into question. So that's where like, I disagree. And, and you know, the futures market and the spot market are very much intertwined. But on, on a net basis, futures, right? Like if I buy spot, I never, I never have to sell it. Like I'll, I'll probably sell some spot at some point, right? But I buy spot, I send my Bitcoin to my cold wallet, cold storage, right? If if I enter a long position or if I enter a short position, at some point in the future, I have to close it. I can never just log off and never like. Okay. There's always a net negative or net zero effect, net negative if you account fees. Um. So again, the, this is where I, I think it's it's a nuanced debate or conversation, but. It, because of the instantaneous settlement of it, because of the fund of flows, because I can buy and, and settle immediately, it's quite different than, let's say, a gold, gold futures market. Very much so. I completely agree with you. Uh, let's talk about BitVM. Yeah, quite exciting stuff. So um, I'm not going to pretend uh, to understand the, the intricacies of it all. Uh, but essentially, what was it? Uh, earlier, like two, three weeks back, yeah. Um, bit this guy, Robin Linus publishes a white paper. Um, I'm in Amsterdam, um, for the, for the Bitcoin conference that's happening later this week. And this guy publishes a paper and it's basically like, Hey, um, we, you know, here's a proof of concept. We figured out how to do compute off chain with a virtual machine and verify it on chain with a fraud proof. Essentially it's, it's not, again, this isn't a 
great technical way to, to or a correct technical way to say it. But in the same way, Lightning has has a system of channels where it, it can verify that, hey, if Preston says, you know, he sent me 100,000 Satoshis and he didn't and he tries to cheat me, right? I can steal, I can, I can take your funds, right? Like I can, I, there's a fraud proof there that if you, do, if you're lying, right, I, I can manually force that channel close and, and, and make sure you're not a cheater. That's what keeps people honest in Lightning. It's a similar sort of, of, um, a dynamic in BitVM where there's there's off-chain computation. And by computation, I mean, if you think about a lot of the stuff that, you know, these altcoins say they do, right? Smart contracts and referencing an Oracle price and, and then derivatives and swaps and all this other stuff. And not that the, the exciting thing here isn't to create the altcoin complex on a Bitcoin on a Bitcoin um, channel or a Bitcoin denominated uh, system. The real exciting thing here is that the value prop per se of the Ethereum's of the world was you, there was all of this functionality that Bitcoin couldn't do. Bitcoin's just a boring rock, right? You can only send and receive. Um, and Robin basically figured out how to, with just with just simple taproot implementation, uh, and it's sim- you know simple proof of concept, but they've been iterating on more and more complex um, designs and versions of this. Um, adding and layering a bit more complexity. And actually, I spoke to Robin for a couple hours um, uh, in Amsterdam and went to a, a bit devs literally the, the day after it was released. And there's like three or four core developers there. And it's like a hyper-technical convo. And he spoke about they're, they're working on creating basically their own version of, of, a, of their own coding language, essentially like a Solidity, like an Ethereum style Solidity, where they created, like a Solidity was actually created for the Ethereum virtual machine. Right. And all that compute goes on chain. Well, Robin and, and the, the guys that are working on BitVM realize that you don't have to, the, the innovation of this is you don't do the compute. You don't do all the verification and the computation on chain. You do it off chain on a virtual machine and then peg it back in to the chain. So all of the, the side chain stuff and swaps and stable coins and all this stuff that people have been talking about as a theory and pegged assets, right? That that wasn't ever possible with Bitcoin, and now there's you know it's still proof of concept, but we now have the ability to do this sort of thing and verify it into the Bitcoin channel. So I think you know probably the the TLDR is that the value prop for basically the entire altcoin complex um, is you know it hasn't been realized yet, but gets destroyed um, because. You can't scale everything on chain, right? That was like the essence of the fork wars, if you remember, obviously. And I wasn't around, but I, I read the history of it, um, of like, oh, we need to infinitely scale the block size to accommodate for all this global global finance. And the, you know, the Bitcoiners and user-activated soft fork said, no, we're not infinitely scaling it. And so B, Bcash was created and Bitcoin SV and all this stupid stuff where they you know scaled up the block size by a crazy amount. Um, and then you have, say, like with Ethereum, right, where you're doing all this complex computation on chain, right? And it's cool. It's innovative. I completely, like, I, I understand it, right? But every, if you look at every time, even just, a, you know, NFTs or meme coins or Shiba Inu get launched on Ethereum, right? What happens? Gas fees spike to the moon, right? Meaning gas, meaning the computation to settle, settle that contract on Ethereum. Because there's so much demand for this block space, right? So what emerged? Well, all of these layer twos, right? Optimism and Arbitrum and and all these other altcoins, right? That were basically forks of Ethereum, Binance Chain and and Avalanche and, and right, like there's a there's a million of them. And to and, reduce the fee, it was become more centralized, right? Yes. To reduce the fee, it was we have to be even more centralized than Ethereum to to be able to do that. But keep going. Essentially, right, and the Solanas yeah. of the world were all, uh, you know, a little bit different implementations, right? But it was essentially we're gonna we're gonna take this, we're gonna you know further centralize, we're gonna expand the block space, we're gonna consolidate the node the node running, and this spectrum of like centralization or scalability kind of gets blended, where it's the you know they all claim to be decentralized, but they're all not, right? Like I don't know anybody that's running a Solana node, right? And you can say like it's important or not. People have these debates of like how much decentralization is needed. But the entire point is that these things can't scale infinitely, right? And so they kept coming into this question of like, how do we scale the thing? Compute on chain, how do we scale it? 
And so, you know, all of these layer twos, right, on Ethereum, they peg in, they all have their own token, right? And they all of the, the, the contracts themselves and the Aves of the world, they all have their own token, right? And so it kind of like, it all dissolves down into like, like the tokenization Web3 thing. And it's like, it's an entire mess. And I, I, you know, don't even encourage people to go in the weeds and follow all this stuff because it's all just like CD, mindless, whatever. But the, the essence of the debate is, okay, well, we all have to do this on chain to verify, to verify, right? On chain. And we all, you know, of course, because of the incentives, the monetary and economic incentives, they all need their own token. And the, the beautiful simplicity of BitVM, which again, I should reiterate, like hasn't been not even close to fully realized yet. But essentially they're like, oh, wait, we, do, we, we can do, you know, trillions of terabytes worth of computation off chain. And, and Boolean logic and logic gates and, you know, yada, 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 technical stuff. And then we can boil it all down into a one Bitcoin transaction and, well, and, and settle. Here's what I find so brilliant about this solution is when you push the processing off chain and to, uh, into the localized hands of the two parties, mm. the frequency of computation is now at their discretion. Yep. Okay. As opposed to a constant update that has to happen on chain. So like, let's say you and I enter into a contract and we don't even need to check that contract for a year based on the terms and conditions of the contract between the two of us. We are, we are locally processing that off chain to make sure that the, that the contract is upheld. Do I need to run that every five seconds? Do I need to run that every day? No, I need to run it. Once, once we're getting close to the year or at that, at that moment in the future, when the terms and conditions of the contract specify that there needs to be some adjudication of the contract. So think about the yeah. energy reduction. Think about the efficiency of this, because we don't have to do that on chain. We just need to validate it on chain after like we come to the terms that there's been some type of event that, that exercises the contract. And if we yep. understand the frequency of that, like this is so, this is so much more intelligent of a way to do smart contracting um, that people were talking about for years. We just didn't know how to to do it. Um, you know, I I said that it, that this Bit VM thing is almost like they found silicon in in the blocks because now you're able to uh, do assembly. They're doing the assembly language now in order to, to um, do the if then or statements with what they're writing into the layer ones. And I, th I think that another thing too is like, so how does validation work? Well, validation works through the, through the debasement of the uh, native token of the quote unquote blockchain of these other, of these other blockchains, right? So you're paying for that validation. You're paying for that processing and computation that's constantly happening through the debasement of the of the native token. You don't have to do any of that with this BitVM solution. I don't know. I, yeah. fi I find the whole thing fascinating. Where I'm a little bit at a loss, and, th and this really comes to just my my lack of technical expertise is is where this fits relative to like what we're seeing with the taproot asset protocol that lightning labs just came out with are they complementary are they competitive uh i just don't know but i, I would imagine they're complementary to each other but I, I truly don't know and if there's people that are listening to this and you want to put some comments out on twitter and uh, when we post this episode i would love to read uh what people think about that um yeah but I'm curious. Do, I, you, do you know, Dylan? I'm just assuming. <laughs> I no. I mean, I I don't have a, a very nuanced take there. Um, I think the the really interesting interesting thing is the you know Taproot was rolled out no, you know November timeframe 2021, and for for a while it was like you know there was somewhat of a narrative whether it was trolling or not. It was like oh this thing was yeah that was stupid worthless right. It was like you did, why you didn't even need that thing, and then ordinals came out. And then, but yeah, and then, like again, I I don't think speculating on JPEGs is the most interesting thing in the world, or you know, BRC twenty tokens, which was a, literally a JSON file to transfer a synthetic token that was valueless, useless on a blockchain. Like that's not exciting for me. But 
the the cool thing was like where an Ethereum NFT is essentially like a you know an image file linked to a website. Well, like actually in, with an, with the Ordinal protocol, you're actually saving it on the blockchain. So is it is it computationally efficient? No, it's not. But there's a bunch of cool people that are saying like, oh hey, like we have this immutable decentralized database essentially ledger. Well, what if we put the WikiLeaks files on Bitcoin forever, right? Like, what if we, what if we do the, and, and it's there forever. So like, again, I don't think that's like the most interesting thing for this. I think the most, you know, the biggest market in the world is global money, but there, I think the the point I'm getting at is that, you know, basically two years after Taproot was, was rolled out, we see things that nobody had thought was like people thought this, this bit VM style implementation was was impossible. It was it was never achievable. And so now, once it was launched, you had a whole bunch of people, even like the smartest guys in the world. I saw like on this stuff, core developers, you know, Adam Back, right? They're 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 like, wait, how does this work? And you know, I, I saw Robin the whole time we're at Amsterdam, we're in the back room, and people are coming up to him, and I'm only following you know fifty percent of the convo, and it's like, wait, how does this work? And there's four core developers at this bit devs and, and Robin does an hour presentation explaining the white paper piece by piece. Someone raises their hand and goes, wait, so what's the point of this again? And <laughs> it was funny to me. Cause I was like, these are like literally like the giga brains of the world. And they're, and they're, you know, there's so much complexity, and technical uh, jargon here that it's hard to follow. And so, but the, the real exciting thing is once people kind of get the basics of it, and they're uh, they're going and doing a hacker house and getting this language built out and documentation and specs. I think there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of of innovation and development on this sort of stuff. And not again, not that the exciting thing for me is like like a Uniswap where you just swap valueless tokens and whatever. Like I don't care about that. It's more so that Bitcoin itself has extremely strong you know, uh, trustless elements to it, decentralized trust, trustless elements. Like I don't have to trust my counterparty. I can, yeah. I, you send me Bitcoin, I don't have to trust you, right? Um, it's it's verified. Um, and so now if we have... Oh, I was just going to say, this is where AI comes in too, which you're yep. saying it's going to be an explosion of growth. It is going to be an explosion of growth because this is effectively assembly language that they're doing for if and or gates on like blocks. Like that would take time to build out and to write and to make sure AI. I mean, that's what the, that's what it's prime for is taking this really obscure stuff and just like, you can ask it a couple questions and it's like banging out stuff so fast and the implementation can just happen at a, at a pace that is somewhat unimaginable. I think I'm sorry. Yep. I interrupted you again, Dylan. I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. I, I think it's a great point. And so, the this I don't think we can imagine what's going to be built in terms of whether it's again whether it's you know, derivative markets right at the, or like lending markets right and whether that's exciting to you or not is is a question but also if you think about just Bitcoin being integrated with the global financial system and everybody was like well you see like it can never work because the seven transactions per second and you know it's it would it will never scale for a global economy and you know, the, the block subsidy and Bitcoin's going to be insecure. And like, well, what if we abstract a bunch of this stuff to higher layers that all has, you know, a, it all takes the trust out of the loop, right? And we can we can have a trustless verification, whether, that, whether that's a lightning implementation and channels, right? To just produce, you know, micropayments or value transfer or, you know, more complex smart contract languages where we can do the things like, you know, the integration with, like, imagine if we have, uh, you know, a Bitmax, but instead of a crypto casino, it's a, a it's a stock settlement platform, right? Mm -hmm. With Bitcoin integrated at the base layer. Like again, that sounds super hyper unrealistic, right? And I'm just kind of throwing out an idea. But all these things that were previously never able to be built, unless there was a centralized infrastructure at the center of it, mm -hmm. can now, in theory, right, with a virtual machine, with an you know essentially infinite compute, can be built. And so, so what's, what's going to be built? I had no idea. And that's like the most exciting thing is that we, someone, we, we figured out the implementation of it. Not we, I, I didn't certainly, <laughs> some really smart people did, but that's where it's exciting. And again, I have no idea what comes of it. 
Um, but uh, there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of activity on Bitcoin. And I, I've seen personally just, you know, side channels, back channels on Twitter. A lot of the people in the altcoin space that have left that, let you know, either they were developers or even just speculators or followers, investors, if you want to call them that, um, that were, you know, interested in the the weeds of all the technical stuff happening on the altcoins. Because again, Bitcoin was this boomer rock that nobody could develop on or do anything with. We're all are all saying like, oh, wow, like this, this makes me question like a lot of the underlying assumptions I had about Bitcoin. And like the, the quote unquote investment thesis, quote unquote, of these these altcoins, et cetera. So I think you're going to see a massive amount of like mindshare come back to Bitcoin. If not, it's already happened. Um, and especially, you know, as the trillions of dollars of capital come in here, it's it's going to be really, really exciting. I don't think we can I don't think we can imagine like what what is going to be built. Right. Like there's, you know, when when lightning came out. Twenty. Eight, I mean, it was developed for a while, but post Segwit, it, it gets rolled out on mainnet 2018. Could you have thought, you know, four years later, five years later, that we have like lightning back stable coins, right? USD synthetic stable coins and derivative markets on Bitcoin, trading futures and all this other stuff. Like that's built, right? And some, you know, the trucks models aren't, some of them are, you know, more centralized than others, right? Of course. But all of that stuff is coming for sure. And it's going to be, you know, it's, it's going to, get faster, better, safer, uh, more secure, and, and, and less centralized, more trustless. So it's quite exciting. This is the last one I got for you. So uh, what is something that you're seeing in this space recently that you think is underreported or not fully appreciated or that just needs to have a, a light kind of shined on it? It's a great question. Um, well, I, I don't think I have too much to, you know, to add about like the ETFs and stuff. I think a lot of that stuff's been covered both on both sides of like, this is hyper bullish um, or like, you know, the downsides of like, oh, well, it's not, not going to get approved for X, Y, and Z un until this happens. I don't think I have too much to add there. Um, here's, here's something. It's, it's a little bit niche, but I think it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, last cycle, you saw a lot of the miners, um, which again, the, the mining industry, well, you know, the Bitcoiners talked about it a bunch. Um, you know, there's, there's now kind of a, an investment landscape around it. There's like 20 or so public companies, 10 billion market cap or so, maybe 15. I'm not sure at the top of my head, but they basically almost all of them, um, were close to blowing up at the bottom of the cycle. And, you know, I know a bunch survived, um, but they were all levered long their ASICs, right? ASICs collateral, Bitcoin, Bitcoin collateralized loans. No one hedged. Everyone was doing a hot oil model, <laughs> and uh, it was max pain scenario. Difficulty and hash rate went up tremendously, right? Hash rate all time highs. So I think like what was that? The high it was like 150x hash or 180x hash, and now it's like 400 something. Like just mm -hmm. crazy, mind boggling. Um, versus you know the price went down 80. percent So it was this max pain scenario where their their hash price, my revenue per uh, per terra hash got decimated. Um, and I think one of the more inter interesting things out there is the advent of a hash rate derivatives uh, marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a couple of companies doing this, um, Luxus doing it, um, as well as Block Green, different models. Um, but, you know, Luxor has like quite literally a hash price futures curve, whereas mm -hmm. Block Green has a, and, and the, the age old question is who's the buyer of a hash rate derivatives contract? Because if it, other than it's maybe a speculator, meaning like who's the buyer of, of hash rate and how do you like, like who's the natural buyer of future hash rate, especially in a scenario where you continue to expect it to go higher and higher. Um, and so like, you know, the block green model is doing it in a Bitcoin denominated way mm -hmm. that every single contract, like it's, it, there's a ton of disclosure. There's a ton of transparency. You know, I know your balance sheet. I know your power prices. I know your operational efficiency, your, your previous states like uptime. And I can come in and, you know, say we expect difficulty to be, you know, X, right? There's some, there's some assumption baked in. Well, similar to kind of like a bond market where there's a credit rating system and a, and a yield excess of the risk-free rate. Well, similar to that, there's on the other end, there's uh, lower and lower discounts um, to what you would expect that, that fair value or that, that hash rate production to be. I can be a buyer of your future hash rate mm -hmm. ads a 10% discount or a 15% discount. So this allows for two things. 
one in a brutal bear market, you can come in and I can, I can, instead of raising debt in a frozen debt market or selling equity, I can sell future hash rate production in Bitcoin denominated terms to raise liquidity. Or in a euphoric up only bear market where everybody's rich, everything's exploding, I can hedge, sell some future hash rate production, get back, get back Bitcoin. And, and maybe, maybe I sell the Bitcoin, maybe I don't. Um, and so that's too, you know, that idea is still very niche. It's still very small and it's, it's niche in a small sector. Um, but I know Block Green's working with a few companies. I know Luxor's um, working really hard. They got a really smart team. And so that's exciting for me is because one, it's a Bitcoin denominated futures market. Or that's technically not a futures market. It's, it's, it's more of like an OPC style um, hedging device. But it's a Bitcoin, you know, it's a Bitcoin denominated capital market for a Bitcoin mm. native commodity in the sense of a hash rate, um, hash rate settled. So that's really interesting. Um, it's very small. I, I don't, don't talk about it too much, but uh, it's something I'm, you know, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse there. I love that. And I love the way that you're describing it as a Bitcoin settled uh, market and just kind of yet another thing that's out there that s slowly uh, creates this uh, situation where Bitcoin is in demand for utility purposes um, and not just for savings technology purposes. And for people that are trying to wrap their head around this, if I was just going to simply describe what this hash rate derivative purpose would be, if you're a miner and you're looking at this fierce competition that's happening in this space, it's protection against that of being able to kind of smooth that out. If all this competition comes on the market and it was more than what you were expecting, you can protect yourself against that. Or if, if the hash rate was lower, then you can take advantage of that. So just kind of a, a real simple way for people to kind of wrap their head around what this, this hash rate derivatives market would, would mean for, and who it would mean it to. Yeah. So. And then like, it, it can't be done in like a, a trustless way, right? Like I can't, there can't be uh, you know, a trustless uh, market where I could go in and sell my future hash rate because what if I just don't deliver, right? What if I just turn off mm -hmm. my ASICs and sell it? Like there, there has to be, there is a, tr like this isn't like this decentralized like sort of thing, but I would, I would kind of compare it to like basically a credit market, right? Where, mm -hmm. where there's, there's trusted institutions that are involved in this. It's a mm -hmm. swap. It's a, there's, there's no risk uh, being eliminated, right? And risk as you want to call it of like, maybe just thinking about, you know, volatility of, of the hash rate, right? Like there's, you, we don't know what the future difficulty is. There's a, there's an assumption baked in, um, there's obviously a discount, um, of what, like, of what they're selling that future hash rate, that what the price is, right? So there's a discount based on, you know, how credit worthy or not, or how risky or not that, that purchase is, you know, or that mining operation is selling it as. So in a similar way, like, I'm not going to lend to a junk corporation at Fed funds plus 100 bips. I'm going to lend to them at Fed funds plus 500 or so, or whatever like the, that junk kind of credit rating scale is. There's a similar thing happening with with hash rate um, production, and um, and that you know that being sold to someone that's interested to in providing liquidity on the other side. So it's like very niche, right? I expect, but I expect in the next cycle that you know hopefully, uh, obviously human psychology takes hold, but I think there will there will at least be another tool for all these mining operations in an extremely cyclical business to hedge risk out because all of them were levered long, you know, they're, they're levered long Bitcoin, their, their, their operation at the, you know, by very definition is, is leveraged long Bitcoin. Um, you know, the ASIC collateralized loans, the whole, the whole nine yards. And so this is just another tool, uh, for them to mitigate some risk. And even in like, say, say the having comes Bitcoin's price is going sideways and who knows, right? Like a lot of these miners will be pretty hurt. Instead of having to go raise or dilute their stock price, right? I could, in theory, I could just sell some some future Bitcoin um, production and, and raise liquidity there, which is an avenue that hasn't existed previously. One of the things I find so fascinating about this whole space, so like when you're talking about how they're levered long and how competitive this this industry is, all all I can think is it's a massive incentive for those rigs to flow into naturally abundant energy source regions, yep. right? Because if you can get it for two cents per kilowatt, you can just compete all day long. Like you just can't because you have such a huge advantage because you're tapping into abundant energy. Uh, 
But if you're paying much higher prices and you're getting levered, like you blow up, all those rigs are just going to flow straight into an area that just has naturally abundant energy. And I find that fascinating. I find that to be totally in harmony with what nature actually wants here. Um, and just, you know, uh, no point other than I just, I kind of. No, it's, 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 it's I'm a more fantastic water. point. <laughs> I it's, just it's not understood that point of like, you know, you'll be, oh, what's going to happen in the next halving when their revenues get cut in half as if it's like a gotcha. And it's like, well, what's going to happen is <laughs> the inefficient commercial miners that are mining on grid energy are going to go under or they're going to have to sell. And, you know, who's going to be mining is like someone in the middle of the, the you know, North Dakota Bakken who has free energy because they're, they're flaring with natural gas um, or, you know, some you know, like excess free energy and some, you know, hydro dam that is, has way too much, you know, has, has way too much energy and, and no one to buy it. Like this, this process of mining and whatever you want to assumptions you want to bake into like what fees are going to be in the future or Bitcoin price, right? You can do like Bitcoin denominated assumptions or dollar denominated. This is going to be commoditized. And the winners aren't going to be these massive scale, you know, consolidated mining operations. It's going to be, you know, the the edge case, hyper efficient miners, you know, like there's people that are heating saunas and, and heating spa spas with ASICs, right? And that heat isn't going to waste. That heat and that energy is actually, you know, the, the, the byproduct of that is is being used to heat things, right? There's like so many use cases that like, nobody has thought of. And and as that that difficulty gets cranked higher, hash rate continues to go up and the block subsidy continues to ratchet lower, that efficiency in aggregate, which is, you know, it's impossible to measure like what's the average energy input cost for the Bitcoin network. We can quantify a lot of things. We can't quantify that. We can kind of guesstimate it. Well, that's that trend is just going to continue of like increased efficiency where I can't my I can't make money mining Bitcoin on my laptop. You know, you used to be able to. Well, like that's a good thing, right? Because this is just increasing the energy efficiency everywhere that it's leveraged, right? Like yeah. Bitcoin's not wasting energy on the ERCOT grid. It's actually, you know, all the the green energy stuff, right? Where I'm going to, you know, a bunch of solar panels and and you know, wind and uh, uh, wind uh, energy, right? Like that, you you can't have that system without something to balance the load, right? So without something to to absorb that excess supply when there is no demand. And so, you know, explaining that nuance is obviously one uh, another thing entirely, but Bitcoin, I guess you would you could argue AI too, right? Of yeah. of kind of a, a dynamic load um a, a dynamic buyer or you know demand for that energy. Um that's, you know, that commo- the commoditization of that is is you know, w- and the convergence of the energy markets is the uh Probably the most fascinating thing. One point I'll add, just kind of going back a bit to the B- bit VM thing, and this is just kind of a side point, and this is just my personal opinion, but I think it's quite ironic that uh, you know seemingly peak ESG, you know low oil prices, um, peak ESG narratives can't really quantify it, but Ethereum, you know, and it's somewhat kind of uh, you know it kind of had a, a network effect of its own in terms of a smart contract chain if you want to call it network went from proof of work right which directly tied to that real world energy input into a proof of stake kind of just completely virtual environment right where the very thing that ties bitcoin like bitcoin's intangible asset has an exchange rate but it's not intangible right because it takes me $40,000 $40,000 to produce bitcoin if i go mine bitcoin in my garage and plug it in or, you know, probably $60,000 per Bitcoin or whatever that my energy input costs are. Like there's a tangible aspect to that. Mm-hmm. So it's not just this like, you know, un- intangible digital asset that's synthetic. It like it is, but there's a marginal energy input cost. Like that's the same reason why like commodities have value. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's the first, Bitcoin's the first thing that like has a completely inelastic supply relative to demand with an input cost. And that's like, I mean, that's the the golden goose, in my opinion. That's like the aha moment of like, this thing is like becoming increasingly harder to produce forever. <laughs> like, uh, that's, that's you know, the, the magic aha moment that I don't think many people have had. Um, and I think it's a bit ironic that you would purposely kill that. But 
that's a different discussion entirely. I love it. I love it. Yeah. For the person that walks up and says, oh, what's going to happen when all these miners? Well, sir, we're actually going to have a free and open market and we're going to find out who deserves them and who doesn't. <laughs> you know, and what a what a beautiful thing to exist in a world where it doesn't seem like too much of that happens these days. So uh, yep. that's why I'm a Bitcoiner. I know that's why you're a Bitcoiner. And boy, uh, what an exciting time to be alive. Dylan, uh, give people a handoff if they want to learn more about you. Uh, thank you for making time and coming on the show. I know I learn a ton from you every time we get a chance to talk. And it's just always such a pleasure. But give people a handoff. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I think it's our, our third rip together, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just on Twitter uh, at Dylan Leclerc underscore on Nosa 2A. Admittedly, got to get on there a bit more. Um, I'm doing some stuff with uh, EKXO management these days, um, among other things, uh, including um, some stuff with uh, with OnRamp. I know you just talked with Jesse Myers recently. Uh, have a small part there. They're doing some cool stuff. Um, and, you know, that, you know, in the face of all the BlackRock ETF stuff, they, had, I think, have a pretty novel uh, Bitcoin native solution. Um, so yeah, I, I, again, I appreciate you having me on. This is always fun. Uh, an hour and a half went by quick. <laughs> it did go by quick. And, and thank you again, uh, Dylan. This was a lot of fun. It is a different market function when you're in a different super cycle. So things don't always work the way that we expect them to, because that's the way that we've always observed them working. Right. And on top of that, we've got high inflation. We've got a, a generational bond bear market and moving into a recession at the same time. It's not quite something that any of us have experienced. 